Overwatch players are truly an interesting breed. Competitive matches are ruined by his and hers eaters, the game browser are overrun with 18 plus kitten latino furry roleplay, and the casual games are filled with creatures so vile they can't even be mentioned in this video. Unfortunately, the esports side of things is no better. From getting groomed by millionaire Chinese businesswomen, to forcing players to retire due to sheer skill, to destroying championship quality teams over shoulder checks, to becoming a millionaire on their own, to doing illicit drugs in the forest with their grandma, Overwatch's top players are truly unique specimens. And one of the most unique of them all is the first player on our list, Far Away 1987. He is one of the most successful Chinese Overwatch players we've ever seen. He emerged on the scene as Yuan Fang 2 in 2017 for Miracle Team 1, playing alongside the greatest Overwatch player of all time, Crystal. China was still finding its footing in the global scene at the time, so when Far Away was selected to the 2017 World Cup team, they had the chance to turn things around for their country. Alongside Leave and Eileen, they placed in the top 8, and Far Away made a lasting impression with teams from around the world. He went on to play for teams like LGD Gaming, which will be important later, with Kaneki and Gaga, and Team CC, which was a dominant team in Asian contenders, alongside Someone, Dia, and many other great Chinese and Korean players who would go on to tear up the Overwatch League. He would later play with the Chengdu Hunters in 2020 and 2022, and moved to Guangzhou Charge with many former Hunters players for the Overwatch League's final season. He was by all means a fantastic flex sport player and was once again selected to represent China in 2023 with an absolutely stacked roster. And although he didn't play much, China finished in second place, losing a close match to Saudi Arabia in the final. Far away helped to turn around the Chinese Overwatch scene and forge it into what it is today, one of the strongest countries in global play. But you may be wondering, what does the 1987 in his username mean? That would be pretty old for professional Overwatch player. Well, that's actually the year his wife, Ling Yu Zhou, was born making her 37 years old. Far away is 22 and would have been about 15 or 16 when he played for LGD Gaming. She is the chief brand officer of LGD Gaming, where Farway used to play when he was younger. The company is one of the largest esports brands in China, receiving 3.2 million pounds in investor funding in 2017, and in 2018, partnering with professional soccer team Paris Saint Germain to create team reciprocity. LGD Gaming has been very successful under Joe's leadership, and I wish she was as good at dating guys her age as she was at leading a company. Though I don't know when they actually met, and I don't know if anything bad happened, and they look happy together in their relationship, so I wish them all the best. The next player on our list went from being considered the greatest DPS player in the world to completely disappearing in the course of a few short weeks. Libero was once called by ESPN the most exciting player in competitive Overwatch. Nowadays, we can barely get a Dexterto article. What a shame. This article is a gem as it says that if Libero wants to learn Roadhog, he should watch Taimu. Libero was one of the best DPS players in the pre-Overwatch League era with Meta Athena where he played alongside Chang Sicko Mode, Nuss, and Hyonu, who was actually cold back in the day. He went straight to the NYXL before he even graduated high school, and immediately made a huge impact to the Overwatch League, helping lead the NYXL to become stage 2 and 3 champions of the first season of the Overwatch League. They went 34-6 and six this season, which was by far the best record. Amidst a group that was struggling in the new playoff environment, Libero was one of the few players who kept up his level of performance, but it was not enough in his career, as the NYXL were never able to make a deep playoff run in his time there. In 2019 and 2020, they would continue to dominate the regular season and struggle in the playoffs, and it became clear that NYXL, the way they were constructed, could not win a championship. On November 18th, 2020, however, NYXL made a surprising announcement that Libero would be leading the team. This was a huge shock, as he never made any indication he was going to quit, and he was one of the most popular players in the league, with over 33,000 followers, and he was still streaming pretty regularly up to the day of the announcement. Afterwards, radio silence. He's now deleted his Twitter and Instagram, and today only his Twitch channel remains inactive. But in late 2021, Libero's former teammate Pine would mention that Libero had been working as some sort of cryptocurrency fund manager, and was making hundreds of millions of Korean won every few months. He did a lot of work with NFTs and seemingly Ethereum, and I hope he got out at the right time. To put that into perspective, 300 million Korean won is 217,000 US dollars. If he's making that every few months, he's doing pretty good. If you want to be making as much money as Libero, you should take a quick second to like this video and subscribe for more valuable content, more valuable than $200,000. Anyway, he was rumored to be making a return in 2021, but that never actually materialized, and Pine said that he had no interest in making a return to Overwatch or working in esports at all at this point in his career. Clearly, he's doing well and doesn't need Overwatch anymore. It's hard to find information about what he's up to nowadays as he shares a name with a famous North Korean composer and jazz singer, so big ups to both of them. The next player had one of the most turbulent careers out of anybody to ever play in the Overwatch League. Fisher finished second place in MVP voting in the league's inaugural season and had highlight after highlight, toting his aggressive playstyle to lead the LA Gladiators to the playoffs. But he actually didn't start his career with the Gladiators, instead being traded there by the London Spitfire. After requesting more playing time from the Spitfire, they were forced to trade him because they had 12 players on the roster and they would rather play Jester. This was the Overwatch League's first trade, and in classic Overwatch contract exploitation fashion, 
Fisher was not told where he was going to be traded until he was already gone. He took it on the chin though, and instead of giving up, he led the glass from being a sub-500 team to the 4th seed, where they played against the London Spitfire in the first round. This was very hyped up, he had a huge vendetta against the Spitfire, and he could finally prove that they made the wrong decision. The day of the first round, however, the Gladiators released a statement saying that I Remix would be playing instead of Fisher because he quote, gave them the best chance to win. The team won 4 games with Remix as their tank in the 10 game stage 1, and lost 9 games with Fisher the rest of the 40 game season. How does that make any sense? The Gladiators famously won the first match of the series using their trick play on Kingsborough, and people actually thought the Gladiators were lucky Fisher was benched in the series because the Glads had had Spitfire's number all season and were sure to win the match. Anyways, the Spitfire went on to win the inaugural season of the Overwatch League, and shortly after they lost, the reason for Fisher's benching was released. He was unhappy with the team's work ethic after he felt he was the only one working hard all season and he wanted to play for an all-Korean team. How petty could the Gladiators management be to bench their best player for saying that? Well, the coach of the Gladiators actually did have some beef with Fisher, but he also had beef with literally everyone else in the Overwatch League. Coach D. Pei created the scandal known as Shoulder Gate, which was only discovered after Gladiators released a public apology that has now been deleted for a scandal that no one in the public knew about. Here is the vast to explain the controversy. Okay, okay, okay. So pretty much it came out, there's like, this random apology came out from Glad, and everyone's like, what the fuck? Like, shoulder, like, and they were like, yeah, we apologize. d -Pay was like physical with some Houston guys in the hallway on accident. But all the Houston guys were like, no, d -Pay fucking barreled at us like an ox. <laughs> like, he just like, saw us in the hallway and leaned in and tried to shoulder check us like some sort of like USSR versus USA hockey game. And like, the Houston guys were telling me this shit. I could not believe it. Like, I could not believe it. I was like, you guys are over-exaggerating. Right? There's no way d -Pay just fucking barreled over you like Nacho Libre, right? Like, there's just no way. And he's like, yeah, he like leaned in and he just like, he bumped us and he, and he looked at us like we saw it dead in his eyes, his lifeless eyes. And he was like, I got you good, didn't I? And I was like, no fucking way. David Pei is five foot six, maybe. You're telling me Prime Jake couldn't handle him? Anyway, definitely the person I'd want running my team. Fisher went on to play with the Soul Dynasty in the next season, finally getting the all-Korean roster he wanted. Once again though, he was mistreated, labeled as a toxic player after he was benched during stage two forcing him to retire later that season. The madman couldn't stay away for long though, and five short months later, he unretired to play for the Vancouver Titans. Unfortunately again, he was paid almost nothing and was denied his redemption attempt after the team basically collapsed due to poor management decisions. He was forcibly removed from the team, and even though all his other teammates were offered contract buyouts, he was not. His contract was flat out terminated, and he may not have actually received any money. Like, at all. He might have lost money on his contract, as he was fined $3,000 for leaking that 2-2-2 roll lock was going to be coming to the game later in the year. Not much known about his whereabouts now, but he's retired from streaming and playing video games for the time being, and is waiting for the next great game to come out. He's probably serving the military, or he recently finished, and I hope he's doing well. Next we have potentially the most famous Overwatch disappearance of all time. Snilla was one of the best Tracer players in the world for years, playing for 123 Philadelphia Fusion and their academy team, Fusion University. He played for the first three Swedish Overwatch World Cup teams where he was great, but he really dominated with Tracer in the first season of the Overwatch League, before being sent to the Contenders team where he dominated even more and led the Fusion Academy to becoming the greatest Contenders team of all time, going undefeated for a full calendar year. He was also one of the most famous players in the league, being featured in many Overwatch League content pieces including the famous Snillo Pillow video. Why are you on a weird dark road with that? It's the Snillo pillow. It's very nice and comfortable at night, and it's not too bad on the eyes either. After a break in the contender season, where the team came back together to practice, Snillo talked about what he did during the break. Here is Elk, his former teammate, to explain. Okay, so for season two of Overwatch League, when I got to the team house, I asked where Snillo was, because he wasn't there. And I was told they couldn't contact him for like four months during the entire off season. And when he finally shows up, he said he was living in the forest in Sweden with his <laughs> grandmother foresting in the woods for mushrooms. And was not <laughs> joking. You know, so you're no telling internet. me that in between him being an esports player, he goes and performs a dramatic a dramatic fairy tale in the forest. That's no, what he, he explained it to me, man. To this day, Snilla was still believed to be living in some sort of Swedish forest, hopefully having a bountiful mushroom harvest. The final person on our list went from being bullied and harassed in real life for being so good at Overwatch to breaking barriers in the Overwatch League all in the span of a few short years. When she was only 16 years old, Gagory was already on top of the Overwatch world. She was the best Zarya player in the world and had a very unique aiming style due to her ridiculous sensitivity and masterful control of her mouse. Even if you watch her highlights today, they're impressive. It was obvious for her to play in tournaments, and dominance would be an understatement for what occurred in her scrims. A lot of articles and testimonials from the time have been deleted, but people who played against her in one of her first scrims in the competitive scene believed she was cheating to such an extent that they swore they would retire 
if it was proven that she was playing legitimately, and others threatened to show up to her house to stop her from cheating. Gagari received countless death threats before, but when it was revealed she was a woman, things only got worse for her. Eventually, she was forced into streaming, with the camera not only showing her hand aiming, but from the back showing that she was in fact actually playing and that there was nothing nefarious happening on the screen. She also got somebody working with the Korean wing of Blizzard to confirm that she was not cheating. Eventually, one of the people who threatened her was revealed to be Zephyr, who unfortunately for everyone involved did not retire after it was revealed that Gagari was not cheating. He was known as the Scrim God for being rumored to be a great player in scrims before the season. Then when it started, he was absolute ass crack. He played for a long time in the league for the Mayhem and Dynasty and had a pretty good career for skill level. Overall, Gagari had a tremendous impact on the game and helped to get countless female fans involved in esports and gaming in general. She's still around today and she makes Overwatch videos and still streams pretty consistently. She's an icon of the gaming and Overwatch community. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe.